Good evening, everyone. We're going to get started right now. Um, I want to thank everyone for joining us um, who is present here tonight, everybody who's joining us virtually. Um, this program is entitled The Cases for Reparation, and it is a four-part series that looks into the mechanisms, the legal procedures, and justifications for slavery reparations. And tonight is the first part of our series where we will focus on the case of Lewis Allen, Crawford Allen, and the entire Allen family. The goal of this series is to go beyond creating arguments in support of reparations, rather using specific cases to show how historical slavery, contemporary slavery, racial violence, and economic disenfranchisement has created such deep disparities that only massive investments in equity and redress can begin to balance. During the course of this four-part series, you will hear cases from Louisiana, Mississippi, and Texas, our neighbors, and that will put reparations into the proper context to allow us to begin to visualize, assign value, and implement monetary redress through the legislative process to the descendants of slavery. And while some may feel as though we're skipping ahead a bit and missing out on an opportunity to argue the why of reparations, these carefully selected cases will clearly show why reparations are needed. And through the Allen family's contributions in their various communities, the Allen family case will show how reparations can change the economic landscape and the trajectory of entire communities. The future installments of this program will dig deeper into the implications of the Leonard Brown and Denver Smith case, the, those murders on Southern University's campus in the 1970s, the decimation of an entire black business district in Sherman, Texas, as well as the murder of a prominent New Orleanian father who was murdered by three Navy sailors. The Southern University Law Center is proud to have a strong and active partnership with the Civil Rights and Restorative Justice Project at Northeastern University School of Law. And because of this partnership, law students have been at the forefront of uncovering, researching, and finding family members of lynching victims of historically motivated, I'm sorry, of racially motivated murders in the Jim Crow South in order to pursue justice and restoration. For nearly 10 years, uh, students of the Law Center have engaged as legal fellows researching under funds uh, using funds acquired uh, under the Emmett Till Bill Act. And if you are familiar with that at all, um, our friend who promoted good trouble, the late Representative John Lewis, fought so hard for um, the Emmett Till Bill Act, and today it is a permanent part of our legislation which provides funding and federal resources to investigate these murders. Today, the Burnham Noble Archive comp comprises over 1,500 cases of racially motivated homicides, and it's housed at MIT. It's one of the largest databases of cases that did not shape the understanding and of our uh, violent, racist Jim Crow South. Today, we get to include those cases to inform our understanding not only of the Jim Crow South, but also the lasting economic impacts of slavery and laws designed to discriminate, disenfranchise, and push those who attempt to rise above their station. Building a better understanding of these historical and contemporary cases will allow us to better inform, better uh, assign value, and develop a matrix by which reparations should be disseminated to the descendants of slaves in America. It's my hope that we approach the subject of reparations with the same seriousness of purpose that this law center has embraced and champions because reparations is not merely a concept, rather a tool of redress that has been utilized to benefit some, but withheld for others for some of the worst atrocities in American history. Today you'll hear from speakers of incidents and occasions of reparations being allocated in communities of people. And at the end of our program, we'll provide you with means of joining in that effort of studying and passing reparations in our Congress. H.R. 40, if you've never heard of it, I'll tell you a little bit about it, but H.R. 40 is our shot to see reparations through on the congressional scale. 
Our goal is to support HR 40 through educational programming such as this, uh, as well as exposure to the tools, knowledge, and research that has gone into these efforts for over 30 years. HR 40 would establish a 15 member commission to study the effects of slavery and discriminatory practices and policies on African Americans and recommend appropriate remedies, including reparations. The commission will report its findings and recommendations to the Congress 18 months after its first meeting and terminate 90 days after the report is submitted. HR 40 would utilize and appropriate $20 million of expenses for the commission, including payroll and support costs for members and support staff. And the bill would also establish civil and criminal pen penalties for failure to comply with a subpoena from the commission. This year's Black History Month presents a chance to acknowledge the full history of black people in the United States and advance both racial healing and justice. And we can do this by urging lawmakers to bring HR 40 to the House floor and support passage of H.R. 14 or 17 as well, which urges the establishment of a U.S. Commission on Truth, Racial Healing, and Transformation. Its, pas its passage would mark the first time a bill on reparations for slavery has passed one of the houses of Congress, and it is an important step in honoring the original purpose behind Black History Month. It's without further ado, and it is my pleasure to introduce the president and founder of the National Reparations League, Mr. Rashad Singleton. Mr. Singleton is a seven time published author, a professional basketball player, entrepreneur, and uh, also president of the National Reparations League, which he created in 2020 with the sole purpose of uniting people across the country to fight and demand reparations for the descendants of enslaved people and Jim Crow. Author of, and I'm going to, to list these books out just in case any of you out there want to read them, I certainly will be. The, the Hypocrisy of Democracy, How the American Dream Became the African American Nightmare. Ode to the Black Queen, God's Greatest Creation. Sounds like a great one. Arise, Brother, this is a call to black kings. And now, the title of his speech today, The Time Is Now, Why Reparations Must Come, Mr. Rashad Singleton. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor Good. Okay. Peace and blessings, family. Uh, first, give an honor to God, who is the head of my life. I want to thank you uh, for having me today. Thank you, Professor Goodley, for all of your hard work for getting me here. Uh, thank you, Sister Monique, for all your hard work for working together to get me here. It is truly a pleasure to be here with you today. People ask why I do what I do. You see, being an athlete, an athlete is supposed to do athlete things. Just play basketball, as y'all know the old saying, shut up and dribble. There are some white people who would love for me to be here speaking with you solely about the issue of sports and basketball. But that is not why I'm here today. I'm a seven-foot brother coming to you to speak about reparations. Even the day before yesterday, a white woman came up to me and she said, how tall are you? Who, who are you playing for? I said, uh, I'm seven feet tall and I don't play for anyone right now. I fight for the descendants of slaves and getting reparations. She said, oh, and gave me a smile. No, good job. No, that's terrific. No, keep up the good work. There was a sense of uncomfortable. There was an uncomfortable feeling there. And I loved it. I loved it. 
Because you have to understand, my brothers and sisters, you have to be willing to make white people feel uncomfortable to get reparations. Now that I have your attention, why is it old? Family, we're talking about chattel slavery. Centuries and centuries of chattel slavery. No other people on the earth was told not to educate themselves. No other people was told, don't read. You see, when the person that's colonized you, they have control of your mind, they have control of your everything. They gave little black babies to alligators. They raped our mothers. They raped our wives. They raped our sisters, our daughters. And got away with it. Until now. So we go through centuries of child of slavery only to go into a hundred years of lynching. What is freedom when we was under the black codes? What is freedom when we was under Jim Crow? That's not freedom. I don't know what you want to call it, but that's not freedom. We get out of all that. Our grandparents' generation get us the right to vote, but they couldn't deal with what? These uppity Negroes. They got it together. We can't deal with this. These Negroes going to HBCUs like Southern University, they're getting highly educated, they're becoming lawyers, they're becoming doctors. What are we going to do about these Negroes' incomes? Massive incarceration. Everybody all right? Yes, sir. Everybody right okay? Ahead, brothers and sisters, they took the black man out of the black home. That's right. Gave us the stereotype that black fathers not there for their families. Well, what did you do to help the process? What happened when it came to uh, welfare? When the black man had to be out of the house, they never came at the white family and the white farmers like that. They never, tell, they never told the white woman working the farm that her husband has to leave the farm in order to get payments. That's right. But my own father told me, yes, son. Yeah, you know, your, your, grandma, your grandmother tried to keep a relationship, but... When the man would come around once a month, we had to hide everything. We had to hide the appliances. If we had a new toaster, we had to hide the toaster. Man. Brothers and sisters, we get through all of that. We're not even dealing with the redlining, the discrimination on the jobs, discrimination in the banks. It's a, it's a, always an assault on our people, and they keep getting away with it. That's right. That's right. And I think about this thing we call land of the free. Mm. How is it home of the brave if you're afraid to pay reparations? Right. We're dealing with a nation that's afraid to pay reparations, but they call themselves the home of the brave. Professor Goodley, I call that hypocrisy. That's what it is. Land of the free for who? Everybody but us. 
You freed our people, didn't give them no land, just as our, our ancestors, they, they, they said they was just thrown out like cattle. Like they just opened the fence, just roaming like cattle. Unacceptable. European so-called Jewish people got reparations. That's right. Certain Native American tribes got reparations. Asian Americans right now getting reparations. And they got reparations already in the 80s. Mm -hmm. That's right. And we're fighting and struggling to get a study done. Clawing and scratching to get a study done, and they are already giving out billions. The time is now. The time is now. When I heard the story, of our brother Louis Allen. Mm -hmm. I was first angry that I haven't heard it before. Why am I just not hearing about this story 2021 and 2022? They did a good job of covering this up. It didn't make it all the way to Florida. You see? And that's what they do. They do a crime, cover it up, right. wait for the people to die. Oh, we did all we could. Understand, we are giving government agencies millions and billions of dollars to do their job. When you pay your tax dollars, the FBI is supposed to do their job. Your sheriff department is supposed to do their job. That's what your tax money is paid for. So I salute Southern University. And, and Professor Goodley for, for creating this event that we can find justice for Brother Lewis Allen, Brother Herbert Lee, because it's ridiculous. You mean to tell me Brother Herbert Lee was going around in the 60s in Mississippi getting black people to vote? You know how dangerous that was? That's why I love black people in New Orleans and Mississippi and Alabama. Because you're so strong. Imagine how fearless you had to be. Barbara. You just keep on. You keep on going, family. You keep on fighting. This is how we get reparations. You never give up. Now, we're talking about an issue where, how, how, how's my time? Good. Okay. We're talking about an issue where our brother, Lewis Allen, being a righteous man, chose to do the right thing and tell what he saw. And for that, his life was threatened. He was abused. Sheriff was coming to his house, beat him. All because he wanted to do the right thing. How many of our people have been abused and mistreated and killed for trying to do the right thing? We owe it to our brother to get justice. We owe it to our brother to get everything that they stole from him. Yes, sir. His family deserves that. I'm tired of white supremacy taking our things. That's right. Generation after generation. Generation after generation. Family, it's no longer time to ask for reparations. It's time to demand reparations. How do you demand reparations? Well, one thing you can do is boycott the businesses that profited directly from abusing us, from slavery. Boycott these businesses. In Birmingham, they boycotted the bus system for a year and shut the city down. 
my beautiful brothers and sisters, what are you willing to boycott for a year to get us liberation, to get us reparations? Old timer told me, white folks only care about loss of life and loss of profit. Loss of life and loss of profit. Now, I'm not here to tell anybody to practice violence by any means. But I'm going to tell you this. You better control how you spend your dollar. Support those who support you. Because once we get reparations, and we will get it, we are going to get it. Once we get it, it does no good to give it right back to them. Learn how to spend money now. So when you get reparations, you'll already have the habits. Come on now. So this is what we're focusing on. Getting justice and getting reparations. And we're not interested in reparations tomorrow. We're not interested in reparations in the future. We're interested in reparations right now. Right now. Thank you. Thank you, Brother Shar Singleton. Thank you so much. Um, you opened us uh, well. <laughs> um, so this is the perfect segue. You mentioned how you had not heard about Lewis Allen's story. And Florida is not that far from Louisiana. Florida is absolutely considered the South. We have a number of cases in Florida that indicate that the same things that were happening in Louisiana, Absolutely. the same things that were happening in Mississippi were also happening in Florida. And so it is a surprise and not a surprise that you did not know the story. But this is what um, is so important about what we're doing in uncovering these cases and telling these stories. Yes. Just by setting the record straight, we are practicing restorative justice. Justice is taken away from a family the moment that the narrative changes a, a millisecond away from the truth. And so putting the truth back into our history is so important that we have made it a project, a permanent project of this law center that students continually investigate, continually make connections with families. Because here's the surprising thing, a lot of the, the families, the descendants of these lynching victims did not realize that their loved one or their ancestor was lynched. And so a lot of times students are reaching out and connecting with family members and telling them a story they had never heard before. And it is not something that they do lightly. It's not something that we do lightly. When I was a student here at the Law Center, I investigated some of these cases. And I can tell you, the case of Lewis Allen was one that stayed with me until today and stays with me forever because I have met descendants of Lewis Allen and they are some of the most amazing people you will ever meet. And they have used tragedy in the most profound and amazing ways that shows the resilience of the human spirit and of black people as a whole. And I applaud um, Lewis for all of his efforts in trying to instill a sense of pride but also economic empowerment for our community and he's going to tell you a little bit more about that 